Good morning, everyone. And uh, it's, uh, as I told Fatma, the first day was really excellent. The participants, uh, the feedback, and, and also the papers that are presented. Uh, so I want to congratulate uh, uh, ERF, uh, Dr. Brahim, Dr. Fatma, uh, for this uh, great uh, effort. Uh, today, our plenary session is on economic diversification in the Gulf, time to redouble efforts. Uh, uh, Dr. Nadir Abbani, Director of Research, Brookings uh, Doha Center. I'm not going to read the bio for uh, our participants today. I think it's on the uh, website of ERF, and this is, will save some time. But only I want to mention to Dr. Nadir. Uh, he's a graduate from Claremont McKenna College, which is uh, a great school. Uh, I'm very proud that I graduated from this school too. So, uh, Dr. Nader, uh, you have 20 minutes, uh, and then we'll open the floor for our panelists. The floor is yours. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Youssef, and, and, and thanks again to um, Dr. Ibrahim and Dr. Fatma and the ERF uh, team for putting together an excellent conference so far. Um, I'm going to, um, basically this is a plenary session. So I think my role is mostly to kind of set the, the, the issues on the table as I see them and maybe then um, engage in a discussion. Um, and, and so I will, uh, that's kind of what I'll do within the time that we have. And I'm going to try to share my screen, inshallah. Did that work? Yeah. OK. Uh, so this is essentially um, is, uh, is looking at economic diversification in the Gulf from a bit of a lens of the social contract. Uh, first of all, it, it tries to re-emphasize the importance of economic diversification, and but it also tries to say that the reason, one of the reasons why it hasn't been successful in the past is is not taking into consideration the GCC social contract. This um, this is a joint paper um, with Najla bin Maimoun here at the Brookings Doha Center, and um, and it's part of kind of a wider project that we're that I'm involved in looking at the social contract or rethinking the social contract within the Middle East region. And so I'll, I'll maybe interject a few ideas throughout the discussion from that uh, broader research. Um, to put everything in a, in a nutshell, right from the beginning, uh, I think um, it might be good just to, to kind of lay out the story right from the beginning. Uh, GCC economies have been trying for decades to reduce their dependence on oil and natural gas. Um, these policy efforts have made some progress, but really haven't been that successful. And partly, I think it's because due to that, these policy efforts have not taken into account the governing social contract in the region. What do we mean by this? Um, the, the Gulf states have been blessed uh, with the wealth of natural resources, oil from oil and natural gas, and and they passed along these natural resources to resources to their citizens through three main channels. One is access to more generous public benefits and services. The second is access to public sector employment, and the third is access for more the business community to government contracts and licenses. So. These channels, as, as we discussed yesterday, and many of the discussants yesterday actually pointed this out, have created market distortions in the labor markets and the capital markets and, and in terms of um, business regulations. And these have weakened efforts to develop competitive economies that are capable of generating sustainable economic growth in a post hydrocarbon future um, that all the GCC countries are heading towards. Um, but it's important to remember, and this is the key point that I think the, the, the paper is resting on, is that these channels, even though they're distortionary, they serve a purpose. They allow citizens to access their legitimate share of the oil and natural gas wealth and maintain what we call in the general region, which is applied to the entire Middle East, kind of an authoritarian bargain with the state. So there is some, um, some state authority that needs to be maintained in the context of the social contract. And, and many of the proposals that we heard um, throughout the past years and even yesterday kind of don't necessarily take into account some elements of this social contract. 
Um, okay, to set the context, and I, I'll go rather quickly on these because they, they repeat a little bit, but it's, it's important to, to understand that the GCC countries are facing fiscal pressures and will continue to face fiscal pressures. Uh, oil prices are down. Um, They're now back up again recently, but they were as low as $23 uh, in April 2020 on, as a monthly average. Um, these downward pressures are likely to continue on the prices. Um, there's potentially the global economic recovery may take time. You know, it's hard to predict the future, but it might. Um, there are significant advances in green energy and green technology that are going to that are increasingly placing pressure on the price of, of uh, hydrocarbons and advances in energy efficiency and storage, which is a major issue, by the way, if you can if you can produce energy from a single point and then distribute it through batteries and other storage devices, then, then you've significantly increased the, the efficiency of, of your energy use. Um, and I, I know that it's, it's difficult to predict the future, but it seems to me we are kind of at, a, at the beginnings of a new age when, when these technologies are now really being, uh, are, are effective, uh, are, are, are being competitive in the market. Um, and, uh, and are likely to become even more competitive in the future. So there, there really is a real change here. Um, time is a factor. Um, in the long term, you know, oil and natural gas reserves will eventually run out, uh, different rates at different countries. Uh, Bahrain is, is kind of the first country in the GCC that uh, their, their oil reserves have now dropped to, to you know, so, so such low levels that they're really not relying on them. Um, uh, nearly as much. In the medium term, oil revenues may decline due to lower global demand, which you mentioned. And in the short term, GCC countries are tapping into their $2 trillion in saved assets and sovereign wealth funds. Before the pandemic, the INF produced a report, which I know you all probably are aware of and what created some controversy, that warned that GCC as a, as a region may deplete its, its wealth by 2034. Of course, different countries are at much different time horizons within this group, but uh, on average. Um, and and uh, the pandemic may have accelerated this. So we, can, we estimated a little bit the net present value of hydrocarbon reserves um, and uh, the net sovereign wealth. And the, the big difference really is, is you know, uh, to, to the, the, the share of citizens in the different groups, um, but also in terms of the, um, the, the untapped uh, reserves. But it, it does show that there are significant pressures across the region, possibly uh, less so in Kuwait, Qatar, and the UAE. But uh, over time, these will, these will also affect those countries. Um, as a share of GDP, um, GCC have made progress, but oil and gas continues to represent over 30-40% of GDP in most countries. And importantly, many other ac economic activities, such as construction and infrastructure, real estate, are supported indirectly by revenues from oil and gas. So just because it looks like indicators of diversification are improving doesn't necessarily mean that real uh, diversification is taking place. Also states with, with less oil and gas reserves um, are to some extent supporting economic activity indirectly from oil, oil revenues through transfers and spending from neighbors. Um, this, this includes possibly uh, Dubai and, and, and Bahrain. So these need to be taken into account. The region still is, the point is that the region still is dependent um, on, on oil and gas, even if some countries, it looks like the share of GDP has dropped significantly. Um, the other key factor, of course, is government revenues and, and across the region, um, uh, they account for 70% or more in most countries. Um, and efforts to diverse revenue streams are similar uh, because uh, the, the revenue streams coming from uh, the nine oil and gas sectors may be depending indirectly on, on, on support from oil and gas. And it's important to think about also some of the state diversification efforts, such as large mega projects that might require long term government support and subsidies. So the nature of diversification in this context is very important. Um, replacing it's important to replace um, essentially uh, oil and natural gas exports. Uh, with other exports. The GCC countries import a lot of their goods and services, and these need to be balanced out by exporting something. When, when there's less oil and gas, they need to export something else that's not dependent on revenues from oil and gas. And this is, this is the key, is, is how what GCC will be trading with the rest of the world. This comes to the, um, the key issues that were raised yesterday uh, in, 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 talk, in, in, in our discussion with um, 
uh, on the issue of productivity and the importance of competitiveness um, across sectors. Uh, that that's essentially how you how you develop how you develop competitiveness and, and trade with the West of the world. Um, the final the final issue I'd like to raise is is looking at FDI. Um, the GCC has about only one percent um, of their GDP. Uh, FDI represents one percent of their GDP. Oman and the UAE are the only two countries that are higher than the global, the world average. Um, but it, this indicates that um, the the investment climate is not that attractive to foreign investors. Uh, a weak business environment is part of the reason, noting, of course, that all GCC countries have made substantial and significant progress in improving their business climate, as you can see from like the doing business uh, survey indicators of the World Bank. Um, but still, behind the scenes, it's difficult for firms to enter the market if they're not connected to an insider um, and to compete. Um, also, many foreign firms are, are, are worried about policy changes that often recur on an ad hoc basis. A basis without much warning. Um, and you see sometimes changes in policy happening very quickly. And foreign investors are, are, are weary of, of an unstable policy environment. Um, at a in, the, in the past, GCC countries had the oil and gas revenues that were enough to afford policy mistakes and arbitrary decisions. But in the future, that's no longer the case. So policy making um, will, will look different in the future. Um, I had a, I had a couple of slides here that were uh, much more text heavy um, uh, th about thinking through the social contract, but uh, but I, then I realized actually that the, you know uh, the, the panelists um, are are the experts on this, so this is meant to be a fire starter and get the conversation going. So I thought it's better simply to think about some of these issues within the contract, uh, the context of a social contract, and I mentioned that the social contract may may mainly is is um, is oil wealth. And, and gas wealth is being transferred to citizens mainly through um, access to benefits and services, jobs, and, and business opportunities, as well as some of it going to social, so sovereign wealth funds. Um, so what, what do we mean by, by, by this? And what are some of the implications of rethinking some of these issues we've discussed within the context of a social contract? And here I'm just going to put some ideas on the table in order to maybe start the discussion. The easiest one, maybe to look at in the context of services, is subsidies. Um, the GCC countries subsidize, especially energy subsidies, are, are among the highest in the world. Um, even in the context of the Middle East, um, subs energy subsidies in, in non-exporting, uh, non-oil exporting countries of the Middle East are, are actually similar to those energy subsidies in oil in exporting countries of, let's say, Latin America. So even non oil exporting countries of the Middle East subsidies are a key part of the equation that needs to be revisited. But in the GCC, even more so. Um, same thing with public services. Um, the, the, the government has taken it upon itself to provide public services and benefits to its citizens. And those that can afford to will, will continue. But as oil and, and gas revenues decline, um, governments and states will be less able to do so. Um, and and they need to really, really rethink about how public services may be supported, and and in the context of a social contract, um, it's 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 this this is one of the key areas where they need to continue. But um, there's a lot of other high net worth individuals, and there's a culture historically in the region of providing benefits. Uh, to the public um, in the context of setting up OPAF for medical reasons, for education purposes. And this has been a little bit forgotten and left aside in the past 50 years because the government essentially has displaced uh, many of these private initiatives. There will be some countries as, as, the, as fiscal constraints become more real where they really need to rethink about um, opening up the space to the private provision of, of some of these public services. Um, in the context where people and citizens actually may want to participate in that. Uh, the, the more, uh, the trickier issues is, is, is regarding jobs. And as we know, um, the, the share of uh, the Gulf citizens that work in the public sector is actually substantial um, across the region. And, um, and initially, when you have enough oil and revenue, you can provide public sector jobs. But as we discussed yesterday, more and more, there's an interest in trying to move citizens over to the private sector. 
And here there's a problem because in the public sector, um, citizens do benefit from higher wages, better benefits, better work conditions, prestige. And the private sector is more interested in, in productivity and what you know what what you can produce and what you can add value to, to the firm. And the governments in the region have tried to support this transition to private sector work, either through, let's say, quotas, um, like Nitaqat in Saudi Arabia, or through wage subsidies, or by increasing the, uh, the visa fees and residency permit fees for, for foreigners and trying to align the costs that way. And these efforts probably need to continue. But now this is about kind of thinking about the social contract. Um, and remembering that citizens are taking these jobs and part of that salary and wage is their, in their view, their share of, of the wealth. So how do you introduce, how do you make that more transparent uh, in a way that, that uh, it can be more managed in a policy framework? Um, one way to do this, for example, would be uh, looking at having a more clearly defined social wage. So if, if a wage, let's say um, a citizen works in the, in the private sector or the public sector and they're getting a wage compared to their, their qualifications and their effort and their productivity, um, introducing something like uh, what in the US would be an earned income tax credit, a, a supplemental wage or a social wage that reflects their share of the, the net wealth of the country and that can be accessed through employment but making it, making it a bit more transparent would allow a discussion to take place with citizens saying, listen, the main part of the wage or this part of the wage is to do the job. And because there's a certain expectation of, of being productive, this part of the wage is the share of, um, of the wealth. Another benefit of, of being a bit more transparent in this and, and more, more mechanical is that as the share, as revenues from oil and gas decline, Governments are in a better position to discuss with their citizens and say, listen, we need to now reduce the social part of the wage because we have less wealth to give. Um, but it's still there. You can see it. And, and we're going to help you improve your skills and improve your ability to be more productive so that you can increase the economic part of the wage. And, and being a bit more transparent then allows us to kind of unpack this relationship a bit in a bit clearer fashion, essentially. That's, that's one way how looking at this, the issue of wages through the lens of a social contract can help maybe identify some, um, some changes that might, be, that might be useful to consider in policy circles. Um, and and this, is, this is different than, let's say, getting kind of um, a university applied uh, benefit, um, basically passing oil wealth directly to citizens in the form of um, a certain amount per person. I mean, there's reasons why, uh, this is not a new idea, it has been proposed throughout, but there's reasons why Gulf states prefer to pass along the wealth through these specific channels. And, um, and so we need to, we need to understand those, uh, what the options are, the policy options are within the context of, of, those, of those possibilities or those channels. The final, the final one is businesses. And this is targeting more the entrepreneurs and the business community and high net worth individuals that are more likely to get their, their share of the wealth through contracts and exclusive licenses than they are through, let's say, employment. Um, and here you have the role of public enterprises. We talked a little bit about uh, you know, the public enterprises role um, in spurring innovation. There's a lot of evidence that actually they've helped improve innovation and they've helped support economic growth and they've helped support diversification. Unfortunately, this is the first part. Um, as, as public enterprises become entrenched, especially in non-oil and gas sectors, uh, they're more likely to, to act as barriers to competition and as barriers to new entry and and essentially as, as regulators of their own market. And this becomes a problem. So um, it's, it's this balancing act between supporting innovation and encouraging growth and diversification, but not letting, it, not letting enterprises become too entrenched that they, that they prevent further competition and further innovation from, from the private sector. And, um, and the, same, the same applies to private sector firms. Um, firms that are, that are owned by citizens and access their share of the wealth through contracts 
Um, one way to think about this is to draw a distinction between business opportunities that derive directly or indirectly from oil and gas revenues and business opportunities or sectors of the economy that the, the, the state or the government wants to rely on to further economic growth, um, diversification, and global competitiveness and, and trade. And that distinction is important because right now the distinction isn't necessarily very clear. What do I mean? So um, let's say construction. I mean, construction for much of, in much of the region is in fact derived from uh, natural resource rents, especially infrastructure. And many of the companies involved in that are uh, owned by, by citizens who are accessing their share of the wealth through these contracts. There's no reason why that can't continue. That's, that's not gonna drive the innovation and the, and the growth necessarily, the diversified growth and, um, and, and, uh, and export oriented industries that you need for long-term diversification. But come to a sector maybe like technology or a sector that really, or other sectors that is not directly reliant on revenues or indirectly reliant on revenues from oil and gas, allow competition to take place freely in those sectors. In fact, that's kind of what's happening in many of these countries uh, through the creation of free zones, uh, through the creation of um, kind of uh, space where, where there's minimal government interference or even government support. Uh, Dubai has led the way in this um, and really allowed uh, companies, foreign companies and, and, and non-nationals and nationals to explore and expand their business opportunities within these sectors that aren't necessarily directly derived from, from rents on, on oil and natural gas. Bahrain has also moved a, a, quite a way in this direction. Um, but uh, so, so that's kind of the, the direction, but being a bit more transparent of this on this point can actually help um, uh, make it clear where, where competitiveness is, where the, which parts, which sectors of the economy are, are, are allowing the pie to grow and allowing the, the country to become more competitive and which sectors of the economy are more shielded and, and, and allowing citizens to access their share of the wealth. So I, I threw some, the, the details in the paper kind of go into some of this discussion, but I decided I wanted to leave kind of this picture up because it can be more like a simple framework for discussion uh, of this panel. Um, is, is there a benefit to thinking of diversification within this lens? And does this help kind of identify what policy priorities may work in, in practice and may actually then, then support true economic diversification? I have a final slide that summarizes some of the ideas I proposed, but I'll, I'll, I'll wait, I'll wait and, and share that at the end um, after, after the discussion. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Yusuf. Thank you, Dr. Nader. Uh, I think, you know, you, you touched on a very important uh, issue and uh, Dr. Majid also, he talked about it yesterday, which is the implicit social contract. Uh, it's, it has a lot of political and economic implication. And uh, as you said, we need to be frank and, and uh, talk about this issue with people and uh, to understand that the, the current situation is, is, cannot be continued and cannot be sustained. Uh, I was reading a few months ago, uh, the World Bank report on Kuwait uh, a mission came to Kuwait in 1961, and the report was published in 1963. And they were talking about the same issues, about the growth in the public sector. Uh, employment is only within the public sector and how to uh, encourage and how to expand the private sector. So I think uh, this time uh, with the, as, as you mentioned, the the decline in oil prices and uh, the uh, and and by 2040 the the oil will be uh, you know not the main source of, of energy i think it's a very serious problem and the policy makers and the rulers should should really pay more attention uh, to this uh, we have three uh, distinguished panelists uh, uh, dr abdurrahman lahmedi is the chairman and uh, the managing director of the Arab Monetary Fund. Uh, Dr. Abdurrahman, I, I believe we all agree on, on the importance of diversification. Do you have an, 
any any ideas or maybe uh, options uh, to and measures to move forward on this issue of diversification. Shukran, Muhammad. Ana, bidayatan ashkur Dr. Ibrahim, zamilat wa zumala ala tanzim hada al-multaka al-mutamiyiz. Aida ashkur Dr. Nader ala al-waraka al-jayida li attafak maha al-tawajjuhat al-aam li ma warada fi hadhi al-waraka. Wa aida Dr. Yusuf bi سعيد بتواجدي معك في هذه الجلسة بخبرتكم الطويلة الأكاديمية والعملية الحقيقة أنه موضوع التنويع الاقتصادي في دول الخليج يعني كلنا نعرف كلنا أبناء الخليج ليس بالجديد بعض دول الخليج بدأت بخططها الاقتصادية للتنويع منذ عام 1970 نحن اليوم تقريبا بعد مرور 50 عاما ماذا أنجزنا وماذا وصلنا كلنا نعرف أن جهود التنويع الاقتصادي في دول الخليج تعتمد على مستوى أسعار النفط المستوى الحالي أعلى بكثير من مستوى أسعار النفط اللي كان سائد في نهاية التسعينات يعني نعرف في نهاية التسعينات وصلت إلى تذكر, تذكر الجميع دكتور يوسف وصلت إلى أقل من عشرة دولار ولذلك كان هناك تحديات كبيرة أنا يعني بمتابعتنا إحنا في صندوق النقد العربي أعتقد أن دول الخليج بالسنوات الأولى للتنويع الاقتصادي ربما الأمور لم تكن واضحة لربما كان هناك تحديات أيضا في الموارد البشرية لكن بدأت دول الخليج تتبنى رؤى استراتيجية 20-30-20-35-20-40 وحتى 20 واحد وسبعين تنظر في يعني ما الإجراءات أو ما القطط التي ممكن اتباعها للتنويع الاقتصادي ولكن هذه الاستراتيجيات حقيقة تتطلب النظر بشكل أعمق كيف نتبنى الإصلاحات ومن ضمن الإصلاحات التي يحتاج النظر لها وربما إدخالها اللي هي لا بد أن يكون هناك تطوير للإرادات الضريبية يمكن ال دكتور نادر لم يتحدث عنها بشكل كبير إدخال الإرادات الضريبية وتنويع الإرادات العامة يتطلب إعادة النظر بالسوشال كونتراكت هذا العقد الاجتماعي بين الحكومات والناس لابد من إعادة النظر فيه وإعادة النظر في منظومة الدعم الحكومي ولابد من تعزيز الحوكمة والشفافية هناك حاجة ماسة إلى الحكمة والشفافية وقدرة التواصل مع الناس لا بد أن نوضح للناس ماذا نريد أن نحقق وماذا نريد أن نصل وبشفافية وبحوكمة واضحة لكي يصلوا إلى قناعة أننا في حاجة في دول الخليج ماسة إلى هذا التنويع الاقتصادي لأن هذا الاعتماد الكبير على النفط سواء بشكل مباشر للإرادات الحكومية أو بالشكل الغير مباشر النفط يعني إحنا لابد أن ننظر إلى ما وصلنا إليه من تنويع الاقتصادي أن للنفط أثر مباشر وأثر غير مباشر أيضا في أثر على القطاعات الأخرى أمامنا الكثير من التحديات تفضل دكتور نادر في ذكرها أمام القطاع الخاص عندنا ارتفاع في تكاليف الإنتاج عندنا تشوهات في سوق العمل وهذه الحاجة ما سال اليوم إلى إعادة النظر في هذا العرض الاجتماعي سوق العمل يحتاج أن ننظر في بناء على التطورات التي كلنا نعرفها شبكات لا بد من حاجة إلى تطوير شبكات الأمان الاجتماعي لتعويض العاطلين عن العمل وليس من خلال التوظيف في القطاع الحكومي القطاع الحكومي في دول الخليج لا يتحمل زيادة التوظيف من المواطنين لا بد أن يكون هناك نظام التأمين ضد البطالة وأن يكون هناك مساهمة فاعلة كما نعرف في الدول التي لا التي لديها تأمين ضد البطالة ولا بد هناك من دعم البحث عن عن العمل ساعات العمل الحكومي لا بد من النظر فيها هي أحد المزايا اللي ذكر الدكتور نادر علي مزايا العمل في القطاع الحكومي أنه بايتو أكلاك أنا أمشي بينما الذي يعمل في القطاع الخاص لا يستطيع أن يترك العمل قبل الساعة الخامسة بعد الظهر وبالتالي هناك مزايا غير مادية العمل الحكومي يوفرها إذا عدنا النظر أعتقد 
في ساعات العمل الحكومي نسأل أنفسنا لماذا في دول الخليج القطاع المالي بشكل عام هناك نجاح لاستقطاب المواطن الخليجي بل وهناك كفاءات تعمل في هذا القطاع المالي سواء كان التأمين سواء كان البنوك سواء كانت شركات التمويل يعني في بعض دول الخليج تصل نسبة التوطين في البنوك إلى أكثر من 90% وهي أعمال مهنية أعمال تتطلب كفاءات عالية بالأعمال الخزينة أعمال الاستثمار إلى غيره من أو الأعمال التقنية في في نظم الدفع وأين هذه الكفاءات البشرية يعني عندما نتحدث عن القطاعات الأخرى بالنسبة للقطاع الخاص إذا هناك حاجة إلى النظر بالنسبة لمجال مالية الحكومة ما في شك أن هناك حاجة لإصلاح فاتورة اللجور هناك حاجة للحوكمة هناك حاجة لتعزيز الشفافية والقدرة على التواصل مع الناس بالشارع لكي نستطيع أن نشرح لهم أي تغييرات إحنا اليوم نمر بأزمة كبيرة وأعتقد دول الخليج مرت ب يعني تحديات مع التغيرات في في سعر النفط لكن أن نحن نمر الآن بأزمة اقتصادية وأزمة صحية أرجو أن لا تتحول إلى أزمة دين عام يعني الدول الآن بدأت تراكم الدين العام ونحتاج دكتور نادر تتحدث عن تعزيز بيئة الاستثمار وفتح المجال أمام الاستثمار الأجنبي الاستثمار الأجنبي ليس الهدف فقط أن يأتي بالمال ولكن أيضا يأتي بالمعرفة الفنية هناك حاجة أن نعزز الاستثمار في هذه المجالات لتنويع المعرفة الفنية بالأمس كان هناك حديث عن دور الشركات والمنشآت الصغيرة والمتوسطة ويعني زميلتنا من الكويت التي شاركت في العرض أوضحت العدد حقيقة وانخفاض النسبة وليست بقية الدول الخليج بأحسن حال هناك حاجة إلى تقوية قطاع المنشآت الصغيرة والمتوسطة لأنه هذا القطاع هو من يخلق العمل جابس المنشآت الصغيرة والمتوسطة إحنا عملنا في فترة الثمانينات على إيجاد كيانات كبيرة شركات النفطية شركات البتروكيماويات ولكن هذه الشركات لم تخلق وراءها داون ستريم من المنشآت الصغيرة والمتوسطة لصناعات تستطيع أن 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 توفر منتجات لصناعات مختلفة وتعزز التصدير لو أخذنا هيكل الصناعة على سبيل المثال في ألمانيا قائم على وجود منشآت صغيرة قادرة على الابتكار وتعزيز كل صناعات السيارات معتمدة على هذه المنشآت حولها منظومة متكاملة من المنشآت الصغيرة التي تعزز الابتكار صندوق النقد العربي لديه قبل أربع سنوات استحدث تسهيل لتعزيز البيئة المواتية للمنشآت الصغيرة والمتوسطة في الدول العربية ولدينا تجارب في عدد من الدول العربية من ضمن طبعا متعددة ولا يستطيع الواحد الآن تغطيتها لكن من ضمن ما وجدناه في بعض الدول العربية أن هناك مؤسسات متعددة أنشئت بغرض تسهيل العمل على المنشآت الصغيرة المتوسطة واستوجدت هذه المنشآت أطر ومتطلبات جديدة ربما تكون ساهمت بإعاقة أيضا نمو هذا القطاع ولا يوجد تنسيق فيما بينها في عدد من الدول عدد كبير من هذه المؤسسات ليس هناك تنسيق فيما بين هذه المنشآت دول الخليج كغيرها من الدول العربية لديها ميزة توفر الجيل الشاب إحنا أكثر من 50% عندنا جيل شاب جيل من الممكن أن يكون مبتكر ومن الممكن أن يكون رواد للأعمال وهم مختلفين على الأقل عن الجيل اللي إحنا نشأنا فيه إحنا كان كانت الطموح لدينا اللي هو الوظيفة الحكومية اليوم الجيل الشاب أنا أعتقد أنه في تفكيره مختلف جدا ويرغب أن يعمل في القطاع الخاص لكن أيضا نحتاج أن نوجد البيئة المناسبة له ولديهم الكثير من الأفكار الابتكارية اليوم العالم بدأ يتحول نحو الاقتصاد الرقمي وبالتالي هناك حاجة إلى أن نكون جاهزين شركات الشركات الكبيرة جدا التي تعتبر من أكبر الشركات العالمية كلها شركات خارج الحدود وستقدم خدماتها في أسواقنا عبر الحدود سيؤدي ذلك إلى تلاشي القاعدة الضريبية والعالم اليوم الجي 20 تناقش اليوم 
كيفية توزيع العائد الضريبي من هذه الشركات الكبيرة حسب مكان الخدمة التي تقدمها ولذلك احنا تحولنا نحو الاقتصاد الرقمي نحو اقتصاد المعرفة هناك حاجة أن ننظر إلى كل التوجهات الحديثة الطاقة البديلة والتمويل المستدام بما فيها عملية التمويل الأخضر نحتاج إحنا كل مرة نحتاج فيها إلى استثمارات داخلية لابد أن نصدر سندات بالعملة الأجنبية لم نطور أسواقنا المحلية لتعزيز التمويل بالعملة المحلية إلى 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 اليوم ولذلك الثروة التي لدينا هي ثروة هائلة يحتاج لدي لها العالم لكن نحتاج أن ننظر إلى كيف أن نستخدم هذه الثروة بالشكل المناسب في تجارب بالعالم المكسيك لديها نفط وأصبحت تنظر له بشكل مختلف إندونيسيا كانت أحد الدول الـ الـ أحد دول أبك واليوم هي ليست من دول أبك أيضا لديها تجربة النرويج لديها تجربة يعني الثروة ليست موجودة فقط لدينا هذه الثروة النفطية موجودة عند غيرنا واستخدمها بشكل ولدينا تجارب ونستطيع أن يكون لدينا تجارب مختلفة عن الآخرين تجارب نابعة من احتياجاتنا في اقتصادياتنا أيضا أرجو أنه إحنا ينظر كل دولة من دول الخليج في صورة مختلفة عن الدول الأخرى لكي يكون لديها نموذج للتنويع الاقتصادي لا نستطيع أن يكون لدينا دبي في كل دولة من الدول الخليجية ولكن ننظر إلى التنويع بما يحقق التكامل الاقتصادي فيما بين دول الخليج وأيضا توجهات الحالية شكرا لكم شكرا شكرا دكتور عبد الرحمن ما شاء الله غطيت اشياء كثيره و very interesting uh, our second speaker is Dr. Ahmed Al uh, he's from the Royal Court Kingdom of Bahrain uh, Dr. Ahmed just to follow up in, in uh, what Dr. Abd Rahman mentioned that are the GCC economies homogeneous uh, can they work closer together or each of these countries are, are competing with the, with the rest of the GCC. And, and if you have any, again, set of recommendations to diversify the GCC economies. You are mute. Go ahead. Good morning. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes, yes, sir. Uh, uh, good morning again. Um, thank you, Dr. Nadir, for this uh, good paper, and um, Dr. Yusuf على إدارة ال الجلسة والأخوان قائمين على المنتدى. الورقة طبعا تبحث في موضوع القديم المتجدد. أحد هموم أهل الخليج والباحثين الاقتصاديين والاجتماعيين وحتى السياسيين ما يطلق عليه بالسوشيال كونتراكت طبعا الوقت ضيق ولكن أنا سأحاول أن أطرح يعني أطرح مجموعة من الأفكار وعلى عجالة أنا بسبيك يعني بتكلم عربي إنجليزي إذا مسموح Uh, أولاً uh, when we are referring to the social contracts and smoothing it and uh, moving forward, we have to incorporate when it comes to the Gulf something that we seldomly uh, viewed uh, the external shocks that we've been exposed to and the impact of this social of this uh, uh, external shocks. على الجبهة الداخلية وتماسك الجبهة الداخلية. How we thought of this؟ دكتور أحمد دكتور أحمد آسف على المقاطعة، بس الترانسليتر اللي قاعد يقول لو تخليك بلغة واحدة أسهل عشان لا هو قاعد يتوفيز. شكرا. أوكي أوكي بنخلي أوكي بنتكلم عربي. يعني. نقطة مهمة أنا أعتقد يجب أن نأخذها في عين الاعتبار عندما نحاول إعادة النظر في العقد الاجتماعي 
وهي الصدمات اللي تعرض لها دول مجلس التعاون خاصة الصدمات الخارجية وربما أكثر هي الصدمات غير الاقتصادية وتأثير ذلك على الجبهة الداخلية وتماسك الجبهة الداخلية هذا أعتقد موضوع استراتيجي ومهم جدا أن يعني من كر... ناخذ في عين الاعتبار عندما نراجع ال... أو كيفية تطوير والمضي قدما وإصلاح الوضع القائم من خلال السوشيال كونتاكت هذا العقد المهم أنا في رأيي الشخصي أن التعامل مع الخليج كما لو أنهم نسخة من بعض أعتقد يحاج لعادة نظر من الصعب جدا أن تضع المشاكل والعوائق التي تواجهها مملكة البحرين مع أخوة من دولة الكويت على سبيل المثال أو الإمارات إحنا الآن اليوم نعاني من عجزين رئيسيين واحد عجز في الميزانية وهناك عجز متذبذب ويتجه أن يكون أكثر مستمر في التريد بالانس أو الميزان التجاري أو وهذا خلق حالة عندنا ما يطلق عليه بالتوين ديفيسيتس وهذه حالة يعني يعني صعبة اقتصاديا لأنها يعني تعرض العملة المحلية للصدمات الخارجية فبالتالي دول الخليج لا تعاني ب يعني الكويت على سبيل المثال او الامارات كما نعاني كما نواجه نحن في البحرين. ولذلك عندما نقترح السياسات وخاصه السياسه الماكرو ماكرو ايكونوميك بوليسيز لازم نكون حذري يعني ندخل اكثر في التفاصيل فبالتالي لا توجد سياسه واحده فت كل يعني يعني ممكن تطبيقها في كل دول مجلس التعاون اعتقد الامور تختلف بعض الشيء على سبيل المثال لما اتكلم عن سوق العمل في البحرين عندنا تجربه انا لست ما ادري ليش يعني ما يتم النظر اليها تجربه رائده جدا في اصلاح سوق العمل البحريني عندنا يعني تجربه رائده جدا جدا لدرجه ان خلقنا عندنا صندوق من اصلاح هذا الصندوق لدى لديه امكانيات ماليه ضخمه جدا ويدعم القطاع الخاص وخاصه الشركات الناشئه وعلى وجه التحديد يعني الناشئه التي تاتي بتكنولوجيا حديثه وهذا الدعم يعني متطور ومتقدم يصل حجمه الى ما يقارب من 80% من رأس المال المؤسسات وهذا كله جاي من طريق الأموال التي التي تم جمعها من خلال إصلاح سوق العمل تم إصلاح سوق العمل ولكن إصلاح سوق العمل مقابل تطوير القطاع الخاص وتوظيف البحرينيين في القطاع الخاص أعتقد هذه مه... يعني نقطة تأكد على ضرورة الاختلاف أو التفاوت في بين دول مجلس التعاون ما يتعلق أنا حاب أتطرق إلى ما يتعلق بالإصلاح في المملكة العربية السعودية هناك طبعا إصلاحات ضخ إصلاح ضخم في المملكة العربية السعودية تسمحوا لي طبعا الأخوان السعوديين ولكن علينا أن نفكر كيف نستثمر احنا الخليجيين بقية دول مجلس التعاون كيف نستثمر هذا النهوض المقبل من 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 في المملكه العربيه السعوديه كيف نستثمر ونكمل المشروع الاصلاحي في المملكه العربيه السعوديه هناك السعوديه الان في حاجه كبيره لتمويل كثير من المشاريع السعوديه في حاجه ل انا على يقين تام الكثير من الاحتياجات سوق العمل احتياجات يا اخي في السياحه كيف نكملهم مثلا احنا في البحرين كيف نكملهم احنا في السياحه 
هل نستمر في السياحة هذه أم إحنا نستمر بأن ندرك تماما أن المملكة العربية السعودية متجهة في اتجاه القطاع السياحي اللي إحنا الآن موجود عندنا فهل نتخلى عن هذا عن هذا الواقع الحالي في السياحة وننتقل إلى خدمات سياحية أكثر تطورا وكذلك دبي يعني طبعا اكثر دول اكثر اكثر دول واماره يمكن راح تتاثر بالاصلاح في المملكه العربيه السعوديه هي هي دبي ومملكه البحرين يعني فبالتالي علينا ان نتخلص من موضوع ان المنافسه والتفكير فقط في المنافسه ونتجه اوكي طبعا لابد من وجود منافسه هذا هذا ظاهرة وعامل مهم ومطلوب ولكن علينا نتفكر كذلك في التكامل لأن نهوض الاقتصاد السعودي راح يكون فرص ليس فقط للسعودية وإنما للعالم الخارجي ليأتي ويساهم في هذا النهوض وإحنا أقرب الناس إليهم وأكثر الناس يعرفونهم فبالتالي علينا أن نسعى لتكميل المشروع المشروع الإصلاح الاقتصادي في المملكة العربية السعودية هذه وجهة نظري أنا الشخصية يعني بشكل ما يتعلق بالنفط دكتور دكتور نادر النفط طبعا تراجع أسعار النفط من دون شك لها تأثيرات سلبية على دول مجلس التعاون ولكن أنا أعتقد النفط كسلعة يعني من لا يجب ان نفكر فيها ب... نفكر بالتخلي عنها ابدا. انا اعتقد النفط سلعه من الممكن ان نطورها لتصبح منتجات اكثر اكثر تطورا. وتراجع اسعار النفط يجب ان يدفعنا باتجاه التفكير في هذا المنحى يعني منحى داون ستريمينج الصناعات داون ستريمينج الصناعات النفطيه. بامكاننا نتجه حتى يا اخي الطلب على البلاستيك في العالم هيوج واحنا عندنا عندنا نفط من ممكن ينتج منتجات بلاستيكيه القيمه المضافه يمكن مرات ومرات على 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 سعر النفط فبالتالي النفط راح يبقى انا اعتقد وراح يبقى وراح يتطور في المرحله القادمه ان شاء الله وشكرا شكرا دكتور احمد دكتور نادر would you like to comment on what دكتور عبد الرحمن دكتور احمد um yes yes absolutely um i well uh, thank you thank you both very much um uh for the comments on the paper boss austria insights i mean this is a plenary discussion so uh, everyone is is presenting their um their point of view dr abdurrahman as you mentioned i mean these are these are policy recommendations going back to the 1960s um and so uh the issue the issue remains very much um recurring shall we say on a regular basis nothing here is necessarily new in terms of this so what what is what is this um what are we what are we thinking in terms of uh looking at um the issue from a slightly different perspective is just to kind of filter policy ideas through through this prism um maybe the uh so the question is really more on the question of the how what to do there's lots of discussion we know why it's important we know why economic diversification is is very important and is key uh for the long-term sustainability and sustainable growth in the region there's a lot of discussions and presentations and policy recommendations about what to do um the the issue then is filtering those into those that can be implemented successfully and those that can't so essentially it's it's more about the how um and and to to raise one issue that was discussed yesterday briefly in the final session for example universal basic income um it it is a very good idea it has been proposed significantly throughout but when you look at it through the prism of the social contract um in the gulf region the, there has been a policy decision to channel uh, to channel uh, resources through through other channels and not directly 
um, there's there's a there's more of a patrimonial approach to to the social contract in the region, and it's not to criticize anything about the state. It's just the nature of how things are done. And so, um, so the question then is, you know, will this work? Not necessarily. So, what what are the alternatives? And I think I think that's that's kind of what uh, Dr. Abdurrahman is getting at. And Dr. Ahmed's um, points are are very valid. Um, this is an important point to mention. Yes, I, I mean when you when you when you try to discuss the region, you 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 tend to draw these broad strokes. And and the paper very much tries to is in the is in the vein of those broad policy issues, more historical trends. And and in the paper we discuss the 60s, 70s, and all the way to to two decades and three decades in the future. Um, and the issue with regard to the difference in in the GCC countries is mostly an issue of timing. Uh, different GCC countries have to deal with these different issues at different points of time. Uh, the, the the country that has to deal with them first is is Bahrain, and they've had to deal with them. And in fact, uh, they've been in, in terms of the labor labor market reforms, they've been actually quite uh, quite impressive. Um, I'm going to share. We're working on another paper related to this that looks a little bit at the at the labor market outcomes, and I will briefly share my screen just to. Um, Hmm, that's interesting. I don't see that option uh, to to share the particular presentation. It's funny. Okay, so I guess I'm not going to share my screen. Um, but the uh, if you look at the nationals uh, or the cit Gulf citizens' employment by sector, you will find that uh, Bahrain is is ahead of everyone else in the Gulf, with less than forty percent of Bahraini citizens employed in the public sector or mixed sectors. This is followed by Oman with around 45% and then Saudi with a little bit more than 45%. And, and this reflects also the timing of the fiscal pressures by that are being faced by the various countries. Bahrain is, is, the, is facing the, the strongest fiscal pressure. And they, as, as Dr. Ahmed mentioned, they have both fiscal and trade deficits to contend with. Oman is also under some uh, some increasing pressure, and, and and Saudi Arabia as well. Of course, Saudi Arabia has a large sovereign wealth fund to draw upon, but it's also trying to make the necessary changes. Kuwait, Qatar, and the UAE less so. Uh, public sector employment among nationals for all three countries is over eighty percent. They have more time on their hands. Um, but the story, the point of the story is isn't to say that uh, I completely agree with Dr. Ahmed when he says that uh, the different GCC countries currently are facing different policy options. But um, but the, the, the mechanisms are the same. The difference is mostly the timing and the pressures are, are similar. The, the issue is just when, when are they being hit? So the other Gulf countries have a lot to learn from Bahrain's experience. And they're going to have a lot to, to learn from Oman and Saudi Arabia's experience. Um, and so that's part of the, part of the nature of, of the discussion. I think Dr. Nof is back online. So I want to maybe stop. Yes, thank you, Dr. Nader. Go ahead, Dr. Nader. Thank you very <laughs> much. Thank you, Dr. Yusuf. And sorry for this uh, disruption, but I think this is what we're uh, living through uh, in, in the COVID times. Uh, uh, I'm very glad to be uh, part of this panel, and I really enjoyed uh, very much reading Dr. Nader's paper. Uh, as I've mentioned earlier, that uh, I'm not sure if my voice will, went through that um, I, I've also worked on uh, this topic uh, in a number of papers before. And uh, uh, of course, uh, as Dr. Abdurrahman mentioned, it's not a new topic in the, in the region. And it's, uh, it's been going through uh, the region for uh, several decades now, I think since, since the uh, early development uh, eras. Uh, so uh, I understand from Dr. Nader's discussion that this um, paper has been going through from uh, from an um, uh, from a social contract uh, point of view. Uh, from my background and from my readings, um, uh, we've looked at diversification from more on economic uh, measurement, and uh, within the economic uh, lit literature of economic diversification, uh, there was a very widespread paper, uh, highly cited by Imz and Waxi in 2003, that finds um, have also uh, quantified the diversification and found that uh, it goes through through a um, a U shape pattern. So uh, in relation to the per capita income. So uh, in other words, uh, countries tend to diversify 
their economies at early stages when the in income is low. And then when income gets higher um, uh, at a certain stage with income, the uh, countries tend to, uh, to specialize in certain sectors. So um, uh, in one of, my, of our attempts, actually, we tried to apply this to GCC countries. And we found that the case uh, within the GCC is different than other developing countries that because um, uh, the actually the U-shape was not applied. And we found that the, um, of course, the specialization was going uh, uh, higher and higher through development uh, and within uh, also uh, in accordance with the higher income per capita in the GCC countries. So uh, I was just thinking that this is, could be a point of view um, that could uh, actually open many questions. Uh, okay, so this is a quantifying uh, issue, but if we look at it from um, uh, in the real world, we can have simple questions such as uh, is GCC economies are, um, uh, are they really different from other developing economies? Uh, are GCC economies also different within, from, within GCC countries uh, in, in, in many aspects? Uh, one aspect is the population structure, which could be, uh, uh, which could be also a challenge and uh, a point of uh, opportunity in other countries in the GCC. Uh, one other aspect is, um, is uh, the competition. It's, it's a small region and uh, the GCC countries are all within the same area. Uh, they have many things in common. Many things in common in terms of uh, if we if we talk about the uh, investment and the uh, also of course the dependency on oil and many other aspects of the economic structure. But uh, how is this going to help in in uh, in attracting foreign investments? And how is this going to help in in uh, finding the unique structure of each country to to build on? Uh, I would I would rather looking at uh, each country by itself. Of course, the distingu distinguished panelists um, uh, just ahead, uh, Dr. Yusuf and Dr. Uh, Ahmed, Dr. Abdurrahman, all mentioned uh, some kind of uh, different uh, aspects of uh, diversification within the countries. Of course, uh, one major challenge that could be more challenging to some countries rather than the others is, is the labor market. Uh, of course, um, we can. We saw also some of the papers yesterday uh, uh, highlighting the cha challenges in labor market, uh, especially in, in in the bigger countries such as uh, Saudi Arabia. Uh, the 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 aim of uh, Saudiization, uh, implementing some policies such as Nitaqat and so on, uh, is uh, all is 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 um, is, is actually uh, showing a, a challenge that is facing GCC. Uh, or actually in particular in Saudi Arabia. So uh, according to these challenges, um, what I see is uh, could be the different goals of diversification. So uh, not all countries or all developing countries aim for diversification per se. Uh, not we, uh, so e economies do not look at diversification just to have, uh, let's say uh, export diversification or labor market diversification. So if you look at the export diversification, it looks at the diversification from an external uh, point of view, but, uh, or actually the external sector. Uh, diversifying the labor market is also diversifying the internal sector, which is the economic base. If uh, the country is looking at uh, or aiming, the goal is to look at, uh, of course, uh, the, the uh, to, to face challenges of the labor market, which means, finding uh, opportunities for new generations, uh, creating new jobs, rather than uh, depending on the huge share of public sector employment. So uh, this creates um, a big challenge in uh, the internal sector of uh, diversification, which is, uh, I think is, is, is the more difficult, uh, which is diversifying uh, labor market, which could be also coming from diversifying the economic base in the country. Uh, why is it more difficult? Because it's uh, creating new sectors, uh, looking at the employment opportunities, if they are attractive to nationals, uh, of course, and finding the, uh, the, 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 the uh, suitable skills and knowledge to fulfill these opportunities. Uh, all of these uh, take time to, to implement. And uh, of course, with the structure of 
uh, being used to the to the to the uh, to the to, to the public sector employment. Of course, creating these new sectors within the private sector is also challenging to make it more attractive to citizens, as uh, mentioned earlier in this uh, panel as well. So this is one one point of view is um, is, is is looking at the specific goal of diversification. Uh, this is, I think, is a very important uh, aspect. Uh, some would argue that um, uh, also uh, is diversification uh, into services, into the services sector, as we are seeing now in the GCC countries. Is it sustainable? Uh, of course, uh, we can see that many, many uh, GCC countries are uh, focusing on, for, for example, tourism. Uh, it's a huge uh, services sector that could, we all agree that it could create lots of jobs. Uh, we can see that here in Saudi Arabia, it was attractive to citizens. Uh, many uh, citizens were uh, entering the, the uh, tourism sectors to uh, either uh, to have SMEs, to have their own SMEs, or even to uh, for employment uh, opportunities. Of course, this all happened in a very small period of time before COVID, but uh, the numbers were uh, very, very uh, promising. So uh, tourism is an attractive sector, for example, and uh, is, it, is it really, uh, is it really um, a sustainable way for uh, diversifying the economy to, uh, to look at it as a, as a sector that could, be, uh, could drive uh, sustainable growth in the future? Is it also going to be um, uh, a major uh, uh, source of income to the country? Uh, this is one aspect. Uh, also another, uh, of course, many other sectors in, within services is the real estate sector and also the, uh, the construction uh, sector, which all, uh, which is also, uh, have been also uh, uh, been, uh, been very strong in many countries within the GCC, financial sector, the banking sector, uh, real estate sector, construction is all, uh, of course, happening within the same time across GCC countries. So instead of the services sector and concentrating on the services sector, um, the development literature uh, agree that the most sustainable uh, sector to for developing uh, for uh, development across um, the world or, or actually also across history is uh, going through manufacturing. We haven't seen any uh, strong any any strong uh, initiatives to uh, to uh, to build the sustainable sector of manufacturing across GCC. Uh, of course, the challenge with manufacturing, uh, the challenges actually with manufacturing could be uh, many. Uh, one is uh, the know-how, uh, second is the high capital, and also uh, the, 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 uh, the, uh, the, the challenge that I can see, uh, of course, with, with the changing trends of manufacturing in, in, the, uh, uh, in, in, in recent ages is that manufacturing is turning into a more capital intensive sector that, rather than it has been in the past where it was uh, a major source of uh, employment for many uh, citizens or many, many people around the world. But uh, recently, manufacturing is uh, being uh, a capital intensive, not employing as many people as it used to be in the, in the past. So uh, also, this could be a challenging point. Uh, at this age, uh, at this certain level of development in the GCC, where manufacturing is still very, uh, uh, very small, let's say, uh, is is delving into manufacturing also a good, uh, a good uh, policy to, to look at? Uh, especially for countries where, uh, just for example, like Saudi Arabia, where employment is very uh, key, uh, it's not going to 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 uh, create many jobs as uh, as it hopes to. Of course, we can argue that uh, it could create jobs uh, within the uh, matching, um, of course, through through the multiplier, within uh, other services that are related to manufacturing, of course. But uh, again. Uh, it would help in export diversification, for, for, for example, but uh, not as much within the um, uh, economic base or within the labor market. So um, uh, these, are, these are the main points uh, I, would, uh, I would add to the discussion. Uh, thank you very much for the time and um, all the best. Thank you, Dr. Nov. 
Dr. Nadir, I'll give you five minutes because you said you have uh, one more slide to show and then we'll open the floor for uh, Q&A. Um, okay, I think, um, uh, let's see, I had some difficulty sharing my screen. Uh, for some reason, the, 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 the presentation isn't coming up, but uh, I guess I'll, if I could reflect just on, on, on Dr. Nov's key points, and I, I, I just to say I agree with her completely, the, the, the labor market issue is key. And, um, and that translates not just into workers, but also into entrepreneurs. I mean, people, people are, are looking to start businesses as well as, as to get employed in, in the various sectors. Um, uh, I told you briefly about the other people working on and employment in the Gulf. Uh, one interesting thing is the youth unemployment rates among nationals in the Gulf is around 30%, which is higher than the Middle East region, um, according to official statistics. Uh, it's difficult to find those statistics. You have to dig and, and search and everything else, but overall they're very high. They're lowest in Qatar. Uh, Qatar has had the ability to absorb young Qataris into the labor market um, because of its, its financial wealth and the size of its population. Um, and uh, Bahrain is, is also relatively low because essentially they've had to make those decisions that they've had to make changes to their to their um, uh, to their labor structure and and, uh, and labor market, as Dr. Ahmed mentioned. Um, but returning to Dr. Nuff's point, it, it, the issue of sectors and identifying where potential competitiveness and growth can come from is extremely important because that's what's going to drive um, both both companies to expand and young people to enter. And it's it's sometimes difficult, as as she insinuated, is manufacturing going to be a good sector? Where is tourism going to succeed? Um, I'd like to just mention a couple of ideas just to, 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 to emphasize that to some extent, exploring competitiveness is an exploration. Um, it's not always obvious. So if, if you could imagine, and I think most of us are, are around can imagine the 1970s, and I'll, I'll bring up the issue of Dubai, but imagine Dubai in the early 1970s. And Imagine where Dubai, if you, were, if you were taking back in a time machine, or if you remember back to 1970, where would you imagine Dubai to be most competitive? Would it possibly be the financial sector, maybe, maybe derivatives of oil and gas, maybe, I mean, if, who knows? But would you have imagined 50 years ago that the Dubai would become the Arab region's top tourist destination and fourth city in the world in terms of MasterCard's Global Destination Cities Index ahead of New York and Tokyo? Was that even a possibility to imagine that back then? You had Beirut, you had Cairo, you had other cities in the Middle East that might have been more, or, or Alexandria that might have been more ahead in terms of the possibility there. Um, how about in terms of the region's largest logistics hub and the region's top financial hub? So. Um, it's, it's not always entirely clear to anticipate um, where, where, uh, which sector would, would, em would, would emerge. For example, I didn't, uh, let's, take, let, let's take Qatar. Qatar right now, Qatar Airways, is the, lar depending on how you calculate it, the largest or the second largest transporter of air freight in the world. So Qatar has now positioned itself quite competitively in terms of air freight, uh, freight in terms of air. To what extent is Qatar leveraging this particular position, its competitiveness in air freight to support, let's say, manufacturing or, or, other, or other aspects of the economy? So there's two questions here. What sectors really will emerge as, as being competitive, number one? And number two, what are countries doing to leverage the competitiveness in one sector to support other sectors? And I think both points uh, speak to Dr. Nov's key, key insights that the sectoral discussion is very, very important. Um, the only thing I'd add is that it's, it's almost an exploratory, and she mentioned this in the context of manufacturing and everything else, it's something that you need to explore and test. It's not something that you can put a five-year plan on and, and, and accurately predict. Thank you, Dr. Nadir. Uh, I have one question to Dr. Nof from Professor Ahmed Qadri. Uh, what is your assessment of uh, Saudi vision of 2030 impacts on the diversification of Saudi Arabia? Dr. Anouf, okay, thank you. Yes. yes, thank you, Dr. Yusuf. Actually, uh, 
Vision 2030 is all about economic diversification. It's, it's about uh, creating uh, new sectors and investments, attracting FDI. And uh, of course, the main, the main goal of the vision is to, uh, to have an economy away from uh, oil. So uh, in many, in, in within the Vision 2030, uh, uh, there are the vision realization programs. Each program, I think they are now uh, about 13 programs. Uh, you can find them all in the Vision's website. Uh, each program focuses on a certain sector that is uh, a key to, uh, to, to have a diversified economy and also to have uh, new, uh, new investments and so on. So for example, there is a, there is a program for the finance, developing the financial sector, a program for developing uh, uh, the the uh, the manufacturing sector, uh, for example. Uh, so um, uh, actually, there has been so far lots of efforts to uh, to to realize those programs and realize those goals. Every five years, uh, those goals are actually um, uh, being revised as well. Great. Dr. Amira Haddad, she wants to make a comment. Two minutes, please. Dr. Amira. Okay, into uh, Samini, Wushaifini. Samainik, but Mushaifinik. Two minutes, okay. please. Okay. All right. Um, uh, talking about the social contract, and I would like to highlight our work here at the German Development Institute, where I work as senior economist on the social contract. So we tackle the social contract using the three piece framework of deliverables. So the government uh, does provision, it provides public goods and services, uh, protection, it protects or its citizens against internal and external violence and participation where it allows its citizens to participate in politics and decision-making. Of course, uh, in the Arab world, uh, we have um, found uh, many states who would just perhaps provide one of these aspects like protection, for instance. Uh, <clears throat> so in return, uh, the governments receives the loyalty and the legitimacy from their citizens who are divided into as many social groups as you could have. So for instance, if you tackle the social contract from an industrial policy, labor market policy perspective, then those social groups are uh, government workers, informal sector workers, uh, private sector workers, business people, labor unions, and the state. Um, in conflict affected countries, these would be the conflict, conflicting parties plus some external uh, um, uh, players. Uh, so basically, I'm raising this because I was happy to see also Dr. Nader uh, using the, the framework of the social contract, and I completely agree with him uh, that he points out that the current crises present a golden chance for GCC governments to, to negotiate the social contract with its citizens uh, about reducing the generous provisions that dampen the incentive of populations to engage in risky business activities. In the chat, I'm going to provide a few links about our uh, papers and our <clears throat> special issue that was published in World Development about the social contract. Uh, yeah, thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Amira. Uh, any other questions? Uh, Dr. Samir, tfaddal. You are muted. Unmute, please. Thanks. Hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, um, many thanks for the distinguished uh, panelists for this very, very interesting uh, panel. Uh, I have a question to, to Nader, which is in light really of what Dr. Nof has said. Uh, in deciding to go from an oil dependent economy to a diversified economy, going to manufacturing or services and so on and so forth, who is going to be making the decision? Do you leave it to the private sector or would this, or should this something be planned on the part of the authorities concerned? And don't forget now that, that of course, in, in, in moving towards diversification, the Gulf countries are going to be competing with other countries as well. With the non, they're going to be competing with the neighbors, you know. I always think of, 
of Lebanon as, as, as an ex past example, because Dr. Nof mentioned that now there is a focus on education as one of the competitive advantages of the Gulf countries and tourism, which were two principal competitive advantages of Lebanon in the past and which Lebanon has now actually lost or is in the process of losing. So how, how, do, how do you decide on this move into a greater diversified economy? And what criteria do you use? And how ready, in fact, are the Gulf countries to move in that direction? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Uh, Nadir, you, you want to reply? Go ahead. Um, yes, I think, um, so this is a this is an important question because I mean a lot of the innovation and the to to reuse a, leap, a word from yesterday again leapfrogging that took place in the Gulf region was driven uh, by uh, public sector investment and public se public enterprises and this has to be acknowledged so so to some extent it was driven by policy decisions um, and and um, and that was that was a necessary first step. Um, so there's a balance now. There's a balance between uh, planning and trying to identify sectors and uh, trying to place investment bets by the public sector and investments in different sectors and an education that that would for the sectors because the education is investment. Do you do you support um, do you support uh, tech education? Do you support management? Do you support uh, um, uh, science, biotech. What, what 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 are you subsidizing? So all this all this relates to planning to some extent. Um, at the same time, there needs to be a space, and this is kind of what I was getting at within the context of the social contract. There is a space for public sector enterprises, and there's a space for uh, for uh, let's say businessmen who are who are uh, working within a social contract to access wealth wealth, uh, uh, oil wealth, but there should also be a space for experimentation, for young people to try out new ideas without, without finding arbitrary limits to those experiments. And, and I think, honestly, this is the main, to, to, to my mind, this will be the, the main driver of potential growth in countries like the GCC, where they can find a balance, where you can say there is a space for, uh, for the planning and vision Definitely, the whole, the whole. That's that's not just a space. That's 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 the key. And there's a space created for the experimentation and allowing entrepreneurs to take risks and to and to pursue what they think are are. are. And, and in fact, that's the story of Lebanon. Um, Lebanon was very much built on an entrepreneurial spirit. Um, maybe less less on the planning side, shall we say? But 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 uh, but essentially essentially the ability of entrepreneurs to to. Um, to, to start off and, and build something that no, no that wasn't there. I mean, Daniel Bliss came and established the American University of Beirut on an empty plot of land. And, and eventually it turned into the premier higher education university in the region. What we're seeing in Lebanon is now a disintegration of the social contract. We see, we see the, the insiders essentially refusing to give up their access to economic rents at the expense of the country. Um, and and that that kind of just reemphasizes the importance of finding a way to maintain two things simultaneously, to allow some element of gamesmanship to to continue because it will. Insiders want to continue accessing things, but at the same time, that it not come at the expense of economic growth, political stability in the case of Lebanon, and continue. So this is the balancing act that I think Lebanon has failed to do. And it kind of, I think, uh, emphasizes the point. Um, just a plug for Dr. Amira's uh, group at the German Development Institute. Um, the, the last person I met before COVID and I wasn't able to travel again was Dr. Bernhard uh, Tautner at, at DI before he left back to, to the ministry. And this is exactly what we were discussing, the issue of, the, of their work on the social contract in the Arab region. Um, so I, I, it's very insightful and, um, and informed some of the work that we're doing on the wider Arab region. So thank you, Dr. Avira. Thank you, Nadu. Uh, I just want to mention two, two issues, if you allow me. The first, 
talking about manufacturing. Uh, I remember in the mid uh, 80s, uh, we, uh, I participated in a study with a group of I am, uh, MIT and Harvard uh, faculty members on diversif diversification uh, issues on the Kuwaiti economy. And when the issue came to manufacturing, uh, I remember Professor uh, Alice Amsden, uh, you know, manufacturing, it, it doesn't have to be uh, the whole operation in, in the GCC countries. Uh, you can have uh, like a chain of, of activities or operation where maybe you can have here the, the, the planning, uh, the administration, the finance, the marketing, and maybe where you go to Bangladesh, India, where is the uh, labor intensive uh, countries, you can have the manufacturing itself there. This is the way that uh, the whole world now is moving uh, toward this with China. The second, the, you know, again, I mentioned it quickly and one of the uh, participants now, uh, social contract is not only economic, uh, it, has, it has other elements, mainly political. So when uh, Nader is saying that uh, to renegotiate the social contract with the public or with the people, I think it differs from one country to another. Uh, and here I want to mention a, a very interesting paper by Stephen Hertog from London School of Economics uh, about uh, uh, UBI and he's called it uh, cash uh, uh, grant. Uh, so, and he tried to link this that people will win by changing the social contract, by removing subsidies and give them cash. Uh, and this cash will be, uh, depends on your income and, and uh, on your age. And, you know, it's, there are some details on that. And the second that people who are working in the private sector will get more of this cash grant than the one who are working in the public sector. So there are different ways to, to change the social contract, but uh, in a very gradual way. And you get the people involved to win from this changing uh, in the social contract. Like now subsidies to the energy, uh, the, the electricity, for example, in Kuwait. The rich people are benefiting more from this uh, subsidies than the middle class or the lower class uh, income uh, household. So I think this negotiate, negotiation, it differs. Countries, the other countries, maybe it's a decision of, of the ruler that, okay, I am going to uh, reduce subsidies in certain uh, sectors. But in Kuwait, where you have a, a very vocal uh, parliament, they will really uh, affect any kind of negotiation of the social contract. I think we, we, Dr. we have two Dr. more Yusuf. minutes. Dr. Fatma, we have two more minutes. Fatma, go ahead. Uh, yeah, Dr. Uh, we lost you. Uh, unmute, Fatma. Uh, Dr. Khaled Abdullah is raising his hand. Okay, Dr. Khaled, one minute. I have to finish at 11.30. Inshallah, I have three points which I would uh, yeah, quickly try to fill them within the, this minute. Number one, I think the discussion which sector, uh, there, there might be another option where you will level the ground and make, uh, yeah, at this the infrastructure, whether it is material or human, and then let the private sector initiative determine which sector they get attracted to. And I see uh, the story of Dubai and Ireland might be interpreted from that perspective. This doesn't mean if you establish certain competitive advantage, you don't capitalize on it. But I think uh, this is another approach rather than engage in too much uh, uh, planning. Uh, the second point uh, has to do with uh, uh, GCC, and this is a big issue, but uh, I will sum it up. I think uh, the GCC unfortunately adopted the European model whereby they focused on 
uh, trade, a, a creation and trade diversion, uh, which I think is totally the, doesn't suit us. This is more uh, for economies that are highly sophisticated and uh, diversified uh, economic structure. I think with GCC, it would have been better if we approach a development approach uh, whereby you know, closer to what we see in the Asian rather than the uh, EU. I had a third point, and I was thinking that that was important also, but I uh, forgot it now because of okay. it and because of the pressure of one minute. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I'm sorry, but I, I have to finish now. Thank you. Uh, Nadir Ahmed Abdurrahman, no, uh, thank you very much for uh, uh, your participation and, and your uh, insight on this issue. Also, that we have uh, almost 50 participants. Uh, I would like to thank them all. And uh, Shireen, the floor is yours now. Thank you, thank you Yusuf. very much, uh, Dr. You. Yusuf, um, for uh, for a fantastic session. Thank you, uh, Dr. Nader, Dr. Abdurrahman, Dr. Ahmed, Dr. Noop. Very inspiring and rich discussion. We're um, really, um, really um, inspired for a lot of issues to follow up on. Uh, all the material, including um, the presentations, and by uh, by a day or so, also the recording for the sessions are going to be there, so we can go back to it for reference. And um, I think you'll be hearing from us very soon to see how we can actually um, take forward some of the key aspects that were raised by way of uh, potentially policy articles for the forum, or how we can map out together next steps.